much has been written about the dark mystique of New Orleans, especially its reputation as one of America's most haunted cities. After all, the 300-year-old town has seen more than its fair share of tragedies and heartbreak. Stories of voodoo and vampires have been prevalent in local lore for ages, and practically every building in the historic French Quarter claims to be haunted in one way or another. But in reality, much of what makes this city such a vibrant tourist destination is the same as that which brews this mysterious atmosphere. New Orleans is a place that refuses to let go of the past, whether good or bad. According to longtime resident and author Tom Piazza, the past in New Orleans cohabits with the present to an extent not even approximated in any other North American city. Perhaps this is why the Crescent City has become infamous for its never-ending supply of legends. For there, stories are never forgotten. Instead, they adapt over time. Of course, one of the French Quarter's most infamous tales is a prime example of this evolution. It is the tale of a mysterious stranger who left a mark on the city so deep that the story of the event is still told to this day. A legend known to many as the Massacre at the Sultan's Palace. My name is Brandon Schecksnyder, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. On the corner of Dauphine and Orleans, in the heart of the New Orleans French Quarter, is the stately Gardet Le Pret Mansion. The three and a half story Greek Revival was built in the 1830s and is said to have been the tallest building in the quarter at the time of its construction. But today, people know the building by a different name, the Sultan's Palace. Not long after the Civil War, a mysterious Turkish man and his servant arrived at the port of New Orleans and rented this building from Creole businessman Jean-Baptiste Le Pretre. Like many in the city, Le Pretre was struggling financially, and this wealthy stranger offered a hefty sum for the lease. The man's name was Suleiman, and according to some, he claimed to be the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire although others say that the neighbors knew nothing of him, but what they could speculate from the opulence and mystery that would soon grace this French Quarter mansion. Almost immediately after receiving keys to the home, the locks and chains on the gates were changed and heavy drapes were hung for privacy. Then, a ship full of Suleiman's fellow countrymen arrived to join him. There was staff to operate the household, a harem of women for entertainment, and of course security for their protection. Neighbors watched as valuable artwork, treasures, and decor from all over the world were paraded into the home, a drastic contrast to most in the city who were struggling financially at the time. But the thing of legend is what happened at night Once the sun went down, the mansion came alive. Music and laughter could be heard echoing through the quarter at all hours, 
and the scents of incense and opium spilled out into the streets of the city. Suspiciously, locals were forbidden from entering, so merchants left deliveries at the door, and in the morning, they returned to find gold bars as payment. This went on day after day, night after night, until one morning, after a particularly fierce storm the night before, a local man found something alarming while out on his morning walk. There was a stream of blood seeping out from underneath the mansion's doors, slowly dripping down the front steps and into the street. Frightened, the man quickly summoned the police and when no one answered the door, they broke it down to discover a truly gruesome scene. The remnants of a vicious massacre unlike any other. Every person in the home, man or woman, was dismembered and their body parts were scattered carelessly throughout the mansion. Yet it was in the courtyard where the most spine-chilling sight was found. There, the men found a freshly dug grave with a human hand protruding upwards out of the dirt as if someone was reaching for air. Now who this man was depends on who you ask, but Suleiman was never seen again. As can be expected, the mystery of who could have perpetrated such a horrendous crime spread through the city like wildfire. Some claim Suleiman was the man in the grave that day, others that he was kidnapped for ransom, or possibly even the victim of pirates who were drawn into the city by his massive displays of wealth. But the most popular theory in town was that Suleiman was no sultan at all. Instead, he was the sultan's banished brother who stole the true ruler's wealth and wives, escaping to New Orleans where he could enjoy this treasure in relative obscurity. If this were in fact true, as many believe it is, it is likely that the massacre was carried out by hired assassins sent by the Turkish ruler. Unfortunately, none of these theories have any basis in truth, and in reality, the lingering debate about who or why obscures the true mystery of the Sultan's Palace Massacre. Was there even a massacre at all? And if there wasn't, then how did this famous French Quarter tale come to be? In its current form, the story of the Sultan's Palace Massacre has been told in New Orleans since at least the 1920s. Helen Pitkin Schertz was the first to publish the tale in her 1922 work, Legends of Louisiana, and for the most part, her version has stood the test of time. A wealthy foreigner arrives, rents the mansion, fills it with silk, jewels, and women, and then proceeds to throw wild parties until one stormy night, everything comes to a bloody end. Schertz, however, makes no mention of a grave in the courtyard. Instead, she writes that the authorities found the remains of the mysterious gentleman seated on the couch, his head nearly severed from his body. Schertz also claimed that ghostly activity had been reported in the mansion as a result of these grisly murders. She wrote, Girlish laughter would ring from the third floor at times. There's a strain of a song reported, a man's pleading and abrupt silence followed by poignant groans. Holy water has proved ineffective in laying the little veiled figures which evanesce through the corridors and up the stairways moaning in flight. Unfortunately, this Louisiana author made a significant mistake in her research. Schertz claims that the massacre took place in 1792, 
almost 50 years prior to the construction of the building where she says it took place. Yet this mistake has not been enough to stop her story from spreading through the area, although modern tellings have altered the supposed timeline to fit the history of the building, which was built in 1836. Of course, this mistake indicates that the history behind the tale is much more complex, and further research into it has proven fruitful, as it seems that while Helen Pitkin's shirts may have been the first to publish the story of a massacre, she wasn't the first to claim the arrival of a mysterious Turkish visitor to the Crescent City. In his 1867 work, The History of Louisiana, Charles Gayer tells a story that he identified sometimes as the quote, legend of the date tree, and others as the tree of the dead. The famed Louisiana historian writes that in early 1727, just nine years after the founding of the colony, quote, a French vessel of war landed at New Orleans a man of haughty mien, who wore Turkish dress and whose whole attendance was a single servant. Louisiana Governor Etienne Perrier greeted the man with the highest distinction and put him up in a comfortable home at the corner of what is now Orleans and Dauphine, but was then the edge of town. Of course, residents quickly grew curious as to the man's identity, but everyone who attempted to question the governor was turned away, so speculation began to grow. Given the governor's heightened interest and the stranger's inability to speak or even understand French, some assumed that he was a prisoner of the state while others' opinions were more grandiose, claiming that, quote, the mysterious stranger was the brother of the sultan or some great personage of the Ottoman Empire. For several months, the mysterious man lived in seclusion, undisturbed, until one day, a report reached New Orleans that a sinister-looking Turkish vessel had just appeared in the nearby Barataria Bay. Not long after, a fierce storm blew through the community, and with it, quote, a body of men who wore the scowling appearance of male factors and ministers of blood were spotted. Then, after the downpour ceased, these men, their ship, and the mysterious stranger were gone. A search of the house yielded no hint as to either the man's identity or his fate, but within was a freshly dug grave where a marble tablet etched in Arabic was left. It read, The justice of heaven is satisfied, and the date tree shall grow on the traitor's tomb. The sublime emperor of the faithful, the supporter of the faith, the omnipotent master and sultan of the world, has redeemed his vow. The people of New Orleans were left with even more questions. But eerily, not long after the man's disappearance, a foreign-looking tree sprouted from that mound of dirt in the courtyard. A date palm tree, which some began to call the Tree of the Dead. In his writings, Charles Gayer identifies this story is one of local oral tradition, and he claims to have first heard the tale in 1820 from an 80-year-old man who had in turn heard it from his father, a resident of early New Orleans. But who either of these men were is unknown, and aside from Gayer's account, there has not yet been any other source that can verify such an event to have occurred, or even that a Turkish vessel was ever seen in Barataria Bay. However, what is absolutely factual is the existence of a date palm tree at the corner of Orleans Avenue and Dauphine Street. 
This tree was an oddity for the landscape of New Orleans, as dates were not native in North America. Instead, they were found throughout Northern Africa and the countries of Southwest Asia, some of which were once part of the Ottoman Empire. While further research into the Turkish gentleman himself has yielded nothing more, research into the legend of the date tree brought surprising results. As it turns out, this very date tree was central to yet another New Orleans tale, one involving the famed New Orleans priest, Père Antoine. Capuchin friar Antonio de Sedea arrived in New Orleans in 1778. At the time, he was a rigid ideologue sent as a representative of the notorious Spanish Inquisition. As one can imagine, this did not sit well with the Creole citizens of New Orleans, so the colonial governor had the clergyman sent back to Spain after he made a destructive mark on the city. On March 21, 1788, a fire broke out in a nearby home and began spreading rapidly through town. But Antonio refused to ring the church bells as a warning to the citizens of danger because it was Good Friday and Catholic tradition would not allow it. As a result, 856 of New Orleans' 1,100 structures were destroyed. But the friar's exile from the city did not last long. In 1795, he returned to New Orleans as pastor of the Church of St. Louis, or what is now the beautiful St. Louis Cathedral. Despite the difficulties of his initial tenure and his reputation as a thorn in the side of the city's governing leaders, the priest's infamy gradually faded over time and his reputation evolved into a beloved member of the community, known not only for his generosity and kindness, but also his generous care for the city's prisoners and enslaved people. Finally, Spanish friar Antonio de Sedea had earned his place in the heart of this mainly French Creole community, who had now taken to calling the man Père Antoine. pastor lived simply, as his religious beliefs demanded. But when he was about 63 years old, Père Antoine came into possession of a piece of property on the corner of Arlene's and Dauphine. The property measured about 60 by 80 feet and is today divided into three separate lots. But Père Antoine did not build a formal house on this land. Rather, he constructed a small hut beneath a tree where he slept on hard boards directly on the ground. And of course that tree was a date palm. Père Antoine cared greatly for the tree, and his affection was well known throughout the community, even after his death in 1829 at the age of 81. In fact, the priest even mentioned the date palm in his last will and testament, under the condition that should any later property owner cut it down, they'd immediately forfeit their rights to the ground. British geologist Charles Lyell described the unique landmark in his 1849 work, Second Visit to the United States. He wrote, quote, The tree is 70 or 80 years old. For Père Antoine, a Roman Catholic priest who died about 20 years ago at the age of 80, told the surveyor that he planted it himself when he was young. Residents of the city clearly associated this unique tree with their beloved priest, and perhaps unsurprisingly, stories about the date palm's origin began to emerge. In 1866, a 
American writer Thomas Bailey Aldrich published Père Antoine's date palm. Aldrich reflects on Lyle's mention of the tree, claiming that it made him even more interested in the priest's story. He recounts that in 1861, while in Alexandria, Virginia, he met a woman from New Orleans named Miss Blondeau, who recounted to him the story of Père Antoine and the origin of the date tree. His work began as such. Near the levee, and not far from the old French cathedral, stands a fine date palm, 30 feet in height, spreading its broad leaves in the alien air. Legend says that when Père Antoine was young, before he took his religious vows and gained the name Antonio, he had a friend named Emile Jardin. The two young men were as close as friends could be, one never seen without the other. They studied, lived, and ate together, all while preparing to enter the clergy. Then one day, their lives were completely upended. A woman the men knew had died unexpectedly, leaving behind a daughter named Angelise, who was about 16 or 17 years old. So Antoine and Emile took the woman in and promised her that they would love and watch over her, as if she were their sister. But Angelise was said to have had a, quote, strange wild beauty that made other women seem pale in comparison. And as the months went by, Antoine's feelings for her turned romantic. Either out of respect or fear, the young man kept his feelings a secret for as long as possible. Then one night, he finally mustered the courage to approach his beloved and ask her to run away with him. But Angelise was gone. She and Emile had left together with nothing but a note that read simply, Do not be angry. Forgive us for we love. This was a heavy blow for young Antoine, but he refused to despair and continued through with his plan to enter the church. For years he heard nothing from the couple, and then one day while in New Orleans, he received a letter. Angelise wrote begging for his assistance. Emile was dead, and she was sick and dying. Would he please take charge of their daughter until she was old enough to enter the convent? But tragically, the end of the letter was hastily scrawled in another hand, as Angelise had died before it was sent. Père Antoine was overjoyed when the young woman arrived in New Orleans, for she looked very much like her mother, and he could clearly see his old friend Emile's features as well. Unfortunately, the girl was not as excited about her new home as Père Antoine was, and within the year it had become obvious that her depression and grief had caused her to grow thinner and her eyes more languid. Concerned, Père Antoine called for a physician, but the man could find nothing wrong with the girl. All the young woman cared to do was rock in a rocking chair and talk about a beautiful palm tree that had waved near the home that she left behind, claiming that one day she would return to see that tree again. But the girl did not make it. Her grief eventually brought her to death, and Père Antoine was left heartbroken all over again. The pastor then dug a grave in his garden for his friend's daughter, and the following summer, a delicate stem with curiously shaped leaves had sprung up from the center. And Antoine tended that small shoot, ensuring that it grew tall and strong. One day, when a passing stranger stopped and admired the tree, Père Antoine admitted that he had no idea what kind of tree it even was, so the stranger informed him that it was indeed a date palm, a tree that would not normally flourish such a latitude. But none of this concerned Père Antoine. All that mattered was that this tree was all he had left of the people 
you loved most in this world. Pierre Antoine died in 1829 at the age of 81, and despite his rocky start in the Crescent City, he was mourned by the entire community and was interred in the St. Louis Cathedral. As for the date palm, it was said to have bloomed its last in 1853 and was eventually cut down at 6 o'clock in the morning on July 12, 1866, as the wood had gone soft and rotten. An article in the Daily States newspaper wrote of the event, quote, The historic Palmetto date tree has been a central figure for many sketches of old New Orleans, and its familiar presence was dear to those residing in the locality, as well as the old citizens, who for so many years had gazed upon it and told of its history. It had become feeble, however, by reason of its great age, and threatened to fall at any moment, endangering human life. At the time of its removal, the tree was believed to have been over 150 years old, proving Père Antoine's association with its origin, one of myth. But notably, the 1853 newspaper article does not discuss the Spanish priest, but rather a mysterious Turkish stranger who arrived in the city in 1727 and later disappeared. Clearly, these tales have intertwined, grown, and evolved together, much like the city of New Orleans itself. Today, the historic Gardet La Prete Mansion stands at 716 Dauphine, just across the street from the property owned by Père Antoine, which is now the lots of 835 through 837 Orleans Avenue. The proximity of these locations is certainly the most likely reason for the convergence of the tales, but how much truth lies within each of them is unknown. Aside from the location of Père Antoine's home and the existence of the date palm, Nothing about these stories can truly be verified. But if a Turkish stranger did in fact arrive in colonial New Orleans almost three centuries ago, the mystery surrounding him has certainly stood the test of time. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast, written and produced by Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Not only will you help us sustain our growth and continue releasing episodes like this one, but you'll receive access to special members-only content and swag. The link is in the show notes. Lucky Lady Shacks. 18 or 80 crippled, blind, or crazy, I'm going dancing tonight. It don't matter which one it gets a hold of me or I get a hold of them, you know. That's Hoot Gibson. I met him at Arky Blue's Silver Dollar in Bandera, Texas. He's just one of many characters you'll hear from in Vanishing Postcards, a podcast where we explore the hidden dives, traditions, and frequently threatened histories discovered by exiting the highways. We don't give a flying flip for... <laughs> Most of your regular bar types. Featuring dispatches from the back roads, Vanishing Postcards is a touching, frequently humorous experience, perfect for when you need a breather, but don't have the time or luxury of jumping in the car. I'm Evan Stern, and I invite you to join this ride by finding Vanishing Postcards wherever you get your podcasts.